No problem. Thank you. Amen. I received that this morning. Thank you, family. Uh, again, we're glad that you're here, whether in the house or tuning in online. Like Dean was mentioning, my name is Brett. I have the honor of serving as our innovations and youth pastor here at C4. And we are in this series titled Family Matters. Everyone say Family Matters. And so just to get you caught up to speed, especially if you're new or you're returning back for the first time uh, in a while, uh, we're glad that you're here. But the Lord has really been highlighting families to us in this season. Like God is doing an incredible work, not just in our biological families, but in our spiritual family as well. And so even back in March where we celebrated Easter together, we titled it, we themed it Easter with the Ohana. And if you're following around uh, in this series, we've been asking really one question, and it's this right here. What is a Jesus-following way of living in community? What does it mean to follow Jesus and live in family? And if we're all gathered here this morning, uh, we all come from different family backgrounds. So when you come in, you have an idea of what family is. I might define family a certain way. You may think of family another, because some of us, we grew up in spaces or um, family dynamics where the home was strong. Mom and dad were present. They taught us. They loved us. For others of us, you know, we grew up in a blended family. For some of us, we, we grew up without parents. For some of us, our parents were busy um, providing and working. And so really the ones we considered family were our friends. All right, so we can all come in here with a different experience and definition of family. And to help us here at C4 in this spiritual family, this is how we're defining it throughout this series. And it's this right here. The people I belong with and the people I belong to. Hey, the people I belong with, but the people I belong to as well. What does that mean? These are the people you are doing life with. They're on the same mission as you. They have the same values of here. And right here in the spiritual family, it's the values of the kingdom of God. These are the people who know me. The people I know them, right? We're doing life. We're celebrating the highs, but we're also together in the lows. And, um, you know, I want to, like, when we're talking about families, it just thinks me, brings me back to my childhood. And you probably could guess where this is going. Um, but I remember at any family gathering, it could be like Mother's Day, Father's Day, Easter, Christmas, Thanksgiving, there was always kind of like the adult's table. And then there was the kid's table. And if you're here today and you grew up in this era of adult's table and kid's table, go ahead and raise your hand. Okay. And many, many parents, like even I find myself uh, with a three-year-old daughter and a one-year-old son, I've just naturally come to this place of there's an adult's table and there's a kid's table. And it, when I thought about this, I was kind of like, why in the world do we even do this? Or have, you, have you ever stopped and think, why do we have an adult's table? Why do we have a kid's table? And when I think about it very like just practically for some of us, we all have different types of tables at the home, right? Logistically, like we just can't fit our kids at the table, right? For some of us, maybe you think a little bit like me. I'm going to kind of just give you a peep into my brain space and how I process my fears. And if you can relate, amen. Just know you're not alone, okay? But sometimes I fear that if I bring my kids to the table a little too soon, they're going to hear something or experience something they weren't ready for. And I have to go back and clean that up. Right? Or maybe like I'm afraid that if they're at the table, what are they going to break? Especially if I'm at a friend's house, what are they going to break? What do I have to pay for? Right? Or, or um, what if they do something at the table that's going to embarrass me? Right? I'm, I, my insecurity would be like, oh, you're going to embarrass me and mom. But really at the end of the day, you're going to embarrass me as dad. Right? Do I have my household in check? Like what, can you like, parent your kids well? Can you father your kids well? The other one is um, like they can become an inconvenience. Right? Another spill I need to clean. Another interrupted conversation. Like I can't talk with my friends or go deep because they're at the table interrupting. Right? I see a lot of head nods, so we're tracking them. I'm not alone this morning. Right? Um, but also like we can think, like, what do they really have to value or contribute? to the table at this conversation, right? And I can tell you that the way we've operated here affects how kids internalize that at this table. How we operate at this table and this table actually shapes their worldview. 
because our experiences shape and form how we view and live life today. And within the context of family matters, our experiences shape and form how we view and live family today. Right? Some of us here, again, we're just at this table because that's what I grew up with. And we have that table because that's just how I grew up with. But I just want to pause a little bit, take us maybe 30,000 feet up to just kind of evaluate what having an adult's table and a kid's table might be doing to our kids. Okay? So when you are at this table and you see mom and dad at that table, right, young people or kids might begin to think or feel that I'm not good enough to be at that table. Right? They may think and feel like, well, I don't really belong at that table. Or they may begin to think, you know what, maybe my voice, it doesn't really matter at that table. Or, you know what, like, I don't know, maybe I just don't know how to, maybe I, there's nothing I can really contribute or bring value to at that table, right? And I can tell you that as a 33-year-old man, okay, I can feel the effects of this today as a 33-year-old man, father of two. Okay, so I'll just share um, an, <laughs> an experience I had maybe about, I forget how long it was, but I was invited into a space. Um, one of our youth workers w- was turning 20, right? So I was honored, I was at their party, and then it was very evident that I kind of like one side of the house, it was all the kids, right? And these are the kids that I get to serve on Thursday nights and be there on them, and I'm like, at 33, I'm double your age, so I don't belong here, Right? But in the kind of like the back of the house in this area, um, I'll just say, I got in trouble for saying old. So I'm going to just, I'm just to say the adults, the adults at that table, you know, we're in their 40s, maybe creeping up into their 50s. And I still kind of felt like, well, do I belong at this table? Because their kids are like teenagers plus, my kids are like three, and I actually didn't know where to go. Right? And I kind of, in a sense, no one made me feel like, Brett, this is for the adult adults only. But like, I was just kind of in that space where I don't know if I belong. What can I even, you know, like I gotta, my, my daughter's three, my son's one. What can I actually contribute here? And I, I just want to say that you can see this kind of generally make its way into the Western American church. Okay, I want to preface, I'm not trying to throw rocks at the church. I'm not trying to belittle or judge or anything like that, but just like the fruit of where we've gone in the past within the church. I mean, you might experience this here, but if you're a parent here, right, this isn't to, to knock on you or anything like that, but just to, for us to kind of just evaluate. When I drop my kid off at kids ministry, what do I expect them to experience? Right? Is it just snacks? Is it just arts and crafts? Is it just a little video? Is it just time so that we can come into this space and we can receive and we can breathe and we can receive, you know what I mean? Or do I actually have the faith and the expectation to believe that when I send them there, there is none of this. There is none of this. That actually the same spirit that rose Jesus from the grave the same spirit that empowered him to perform signs, wonders, and miracles, the same spirit that lives in mom and dad actually lives in them too. Do I believe that the same power we get to experience here can actually happen on that side? Right? So I'm talking to the parents with teens. When you drop off your kid at Collide on Thursday night, like, is it just like, oh, okay, they're going to they're gonna be good. They're going to get dinner. They're not going to get in trouble tonight. Well, that's a maybe. Okay, that's a maybe. Pray for your child. I pray for your child. I pray for our team prays for your children. Okay. Ooh, this isn't my confessional booth, right? Okay. But anyway, all to say, what are you expecting to happen here on Thursday night? Right? We, what, do you expect what we experienced this Sunday morning? Right? Like when the youth, even for, for a long time, it's not a bad thing. Again, this is just, this is just, what it was, but it's, it's typical or it's easy to stay in the space where like the youth are leading worship. It's a youth takeover. Yes, so good. Take out your camera, right? It's like cheerlead, encourage, and we want to encourage them. But do I actually believe and have the faith that these kids up here can take us to the throne room just like Pastor Imua, just as much as Pastor Tifa, just as much as Isaiah? Do we actually have that type of faith? 
And ultimately, it's led us to this place where we kind of hear the phrase, a junior Holy Spirit, right? But I'm pretty sure scripture does not say the Lord descended the varsity Holy Spirit onto Jesus and to the cakey he gave the junior Holy Spirit or the little league junior spirit. There is only one spirit of God and his name is Holy Spirit. Does that make sense? Okay. And so I want to make this a little personal for us because if we continue down this path where there's an adult's table and a kid's table, even within the church, even when it comes to our life walking with Jesus, my heart is not to be morbid. I just want to paint a picture because this is a big deal. And I take it very seriously now being a father of two, being the youth pastor here entrusted to our teenagers, our 7th to 12th graders. We were um, in a staff meeting this week, and we had the honor of having um, Pastor John Tyson share with us. He, he pastors a church up at New York. He's passionate about men's ministry and fathers taking the rightful place within the home and leading their families well. He's also passionate about next generation discipleship. And so he does a whole bunch of research through Barna and all these different um, sites. And what he shared with us is if we continue down this path of the way it's currently going, one million kids will walk away from their faith this year. One million. And I think it's easy to look at, obviously, that's across the board, right? But I did a little bit more research of how this relates to us here in the islands. Looking at the DOE, Department of Education, with the private school, just the current enrollment right now, from kindergarten to 12th grade, that's just over 200,000 kids. And it hits home for me because I go to this space, if we don't do anything to change, if we don't do anything to break this, the whole state of Hawaii could lose a generation. That could be our state. I'm, I'm putting a stake in the ground and say that will not be us. Say that will not be us. We want to be people who can break this current paradigm so that we would see a million run toward the Lord. We would see 200,000 plus run towards Jesus. Does that make sense? Okay, because I believe that God is asking us this morning and in this season to make a shift. How we think, what we believe, how we live. Because what God desires for our spiritual family is vastly sometimes different or vastly different from how we view it. Because he doesn't see an adult's table. He doesn't see a kid's table. He just sees one table. And everybody's invited. Everyone is welcomed. So that if there's one thing that I want us to take home today, it's this right here. Everyone. Say everyone. Everyone belongs at the table. Everyone belongs at the table. And if you, hear, uh, if you were here last week with what Pastor Chad had to share about what it means to start to pass down generational blessings, I really believe that if we got this right, if we got this right, it's one of the greatest generational blessings that we can pass on to our children and our children's children. Does that make sense? So I just want to make sure we're, we're on the same page right now, okay, that there is no junior Holy Spirit. Thumbs up if you agree, okay? There is one table, thumbs up if you agree, and everyone belongs at the table if you agree, say amen, amen. okay? And it's not just a theory, it's not just a good thing, right? But we see this all throughout scripture, okay? I'm just going to take us, breeze through a few, but if we could read this all together, and when we read the word of God, I'm going to say put some holy sriracha on it, put some holy chi chili pepper water on it. You wonder why kids don't actually, oh, well, God did this, and God, God has a... How do we respond to the word of God? So this is practical right now. I'm not telling you to shout like a madman. I'm just telling you, declare the word of God. Ready, go. Then children were brought to him that he might lay his hands on them and pray. The disciples rebuked the people, but Jesus said, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of heaven. Who is Jesus saying is welcome to come to me? the children, right? Even in the book of Acts, they're referring to Joel's prophecy in the Old Testament. In the last days, it shall be God declares that I will pour my spirit on who? All flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And who? Your young men shall see visions. And your old men shall dream 
dreams. Even in the book of 1 Timothy, Paul writes, let no one despise you because of your what? Youth. But set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. And I'm thanking God today that we got to witness this firsthand. Firsthand in the portion. I mean, they're not even singing like, these are some like deep songs. You weren't coming to church today expecting just out the gates, Jesus, we love you. And Yeshua. You know what I'm saying? And Tim- Timothy's saying, hey, it's not because you're JV or intermediate or little league. Actually, we're trying to break that. And I love when we get to look back at the Old Testament, we read about King Josiah. Josiah was how old? Eight years old. If I'm the Lord, that is a horrible plan to have an eight-year-old become king. I have a three-year-old. I love her with all of my heart. I can't, I mean, God's going to do an amazing work in her in the next five years, but gosh, I hope she's not queen of this land. You know what I'm saying? Like we have 18-year-olds and 15-year-olds moving in the power of God, but I can guarantee there's a little bit of fear in you if they got elected as governor, Lord Jesus, come quickly, right? But God does not see it that way. God does not see that. He said, Josiah, at eight years old, you become king. And he reigned in for 18 years. Or sorry, sorry, 31 years. But I wanted to say, look at this as kind of like what he was able to accomplish. And what he stepped into, maybe not at eight, but in his 20s, this is what King Josiah did. He repaired the temple. He discovered and reinstated the book of the law or the book of the covenant, the word of God. He led the people of God back to following the Lord. He destroyed the idols, the mediums, and the false gods, and he restored the Passover. Okay, I want to highlight this really quickly. The Passover was the biggest and most important celebration to the people of Israel because it reminded the people of God of how Yahweh delivered them from slavery, literally led them into a new place, how he rescued them, right? And as a human being, you know you're prone to what? Forget. And so can you imagine, 350 years go by, and they're not remembering the faithfulness and the promises of God. But King Josiah comes in and is like, no, 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 no. We're not going to forget. We're actually going to begin to remember. We want to remember the promises of our God. We want to remember the faithfulness of our king from generation to generation to generation. So everyone, everybody belongs at the table. Amen? And I just want to share this because I know that like I shared like, okay, one million who could be walking away, but we're dedicating that we're going to see a million run to Jesus, right? I don't want to be like, what is, is this not happening at all? I'm proud to say, and I'm not saying, I'm not saying this to elevate C4 by any means, but God is doing an incredible work across the board. And I can say up here with such confidence that as a church in our leadership, I'm grateful for Pastor Creighton. I'm grateful for Pastor Kim. I'm grateful to Dean because we're seeing this little right here, it's beginning to go away. We're not approaching things here where there's an adults and the professionals and then the kids. Right? If you've come to um, Sunday services or you look back to Easter or Christmases or whatever and you see the ministry team, it's not just the adults. There are kids praying. And we don't just let the old oh, kids, you pray for the kids. They're praying for you. They're giving you prophetic words. They're speaking prophetic promise over your family and your marriage and your future, right? We saw a season of of what we called family equipping services. Anyone remember that? You remember how chaotic that was and how much of a mess that was? You know why? It's because parents and kids were in the same room together. It's not like the parents stayed here, the kids went over there. We were all in the same room. You see on our Sunday service now, the kids don't go there first. They worship with us. Worship isn't just something you can graduate to and then you can have access. No, it's now. It's now. In family circles, it's no longer adults do Bible study and adults talk about the hard stuff. And the kids, this is your blessing because today you get Netflix or Disney+. Plus. It's like, no, we are walking through everything together. We are writing down things together. And everything's age appropriate, right? But we are writing down everything. And we are actually pursuing, we're praying together. Even within the context of, of Collide. And man, if you ever want to take a, a visit 
like, just let me know because we're on a Thursday night. You don't get to see what's happening there. But this right here for worship, that's a weekly thing for us. Students are stepping out in faith. They're the ones sharing their testimonies. They're the ones praying for one another. They're the ones who are saying, hey, I want to lead the Bible study. Hey, Brett, what if we decided to do this? So I just want to say and reassure us that it's happening. I just feel like today we have to double down. We're going to say, God, you're moving here. How do we go one step further? So everyone belongs at the table. And I just want to give us more. It's a general practical, so you may have to fill in blanks. I'll give in some examples about how do we do this. We need to begin to invite our kids in and bring them along. Right? We have to invite them in and bring them along. We need them to know you're at the table. And I'm at the table. And we're at the table together. And, you know, I'm a, a, a parent of, of two little ones, and so it looks different because I'm not diving into the book of Revelation or holding this deep Bible study. Like, I'm trying to, like, just get, I don't know what I'm even trying to get. You know what I mean? Like, it's just there. But what we've tried to do, and for me, like, I don't like to have to clean up all the mess. I want to keep it perfect so that when we put them down, I can just breathe. I don't want to have to go back to clean up a whole bunch of stuff. Okay, this is not my counseling session. Move forward. Okay. Anyway. What we've been trying to implement, though, is we ha- this is our table, right? We don't have a table at the house. Obviously, Cole has his high chair. That's just where he needs to be in this season. But we've been trying to make an effort where Lainey, Mommy, and Daddy are all at the table together. And we try to just ask questions like, what are you grateful for? You know, what did you enjoy today? Right? What was fun today? Right? I wasn't asking her, so what's the revelation that the Lord gave you today? Right, Because I think sometimes we go like, oh, secular and sacred. But to me, it's all sacred. Because when I'm asking her questions, I want to know, Lainey, you have a voice at this table. Hey, what do you want to do today? You, have, you can contribute to this family. Right? And for, for some of us here, you, you probably have older kids. Right? And so you're going to have to bring them in to this side. Right? You've got you to invite them into your Bible study. You've got to show them how to read the word. You got to show them how to pray, right? Just don't whatever, you know, figure it out, right? But I just look at any opportunity that I have, whether I think it's spiritual or not, it's a way for me to communicate, you belong with me. We're doing this together. I'm going to teach you how to cook the food. I'm going to teach you how to uh, fill up gas. I'm going to teach you how to wash the car. I'm going to teach you how to wash the dish. I just want to bring them in and like invite them in and bring them along at every opportunity. Does that make sense? And this doesn't just apply to, like, the ones with biological families. This is a spiritual family thing, right? Because all of us, we might have a nephew. We might have a niece. You might have younger cousins. You might have younger siblings. You might see somebody here that, like, whoa, the Lord's hiding. Like, wait, how? hey, like, I just want to have coffee. Like, how can we get to know one another? So this is a thing that it applies to all of us. Nobody's exempt. But we as a spiritual family, how can we invite them in and bring them along? It's tracking? Make sense? Okay, good. So one thing for us to, yeah, that's a pretty good quote. We'll just say that there. I, I just was preaching. I forgot about this. This is great. I think this is from Pastor Wayne Cordero. You don't just teach what you know. You reproduce who you are. And we can talk about there's one table and everyone's invited and no junior Holy Spirit, but we're going to reproduce how we live, the life I live. And I can say it all I want, but if I actually don't live it, they're not going to get it. And we'll continue to see generation to generation, adults and kids, but we want to see one and everyone's invited. Amen? Okay? So I think it's also important to just acknowledge that if we want to get there, one table, everyone's invited, everyone's around the table, we have to acknowledge that we as generations have not necessarily worked well together throughout history. There actually can be a divide. Right? And maybe you're here and you're part of the older or the generations that have gone before, right? where you've had your judgments, your stereotypes, your lack of confidence, your expectations towards the younger generation. Right? Like, hey, look at everything that we've built and why are they ruining it? That, like, why would you even want to do it that way? Right? And there's been the generations who are emerging 
who are like, why do we have to clean up your mess? You didn't get it right, so why, why do we have to change it? Like, because you didn't take care of your stuff, now I have to deal with it. And you can see there's this actual, like, divide and almost this animosity towards one another. There's this bitterness, there's this resentment, there's this blame game that begins to play out where nobody's taking ownership of our stuff. But we actually, for, the, for this to be seen, we need as generations to come together. Because if we want to see one table where everyone belongs, it's going to require the empowerment of one generation and the wisdom of another. Right? We need the passion and the zeal and the innovation and the childlikeness of the generations who are coming up. But the generations who are coming up, we, you need the wisdom, the discernment, the stories, the history, and the blessing of those who've gone before. And when we look at, again, um, another king in the Old Testament, um, King Joash, right? We thought eight was pretty gnarly. God's like, you know what? How about we do seven? How about seven years? Seven years old, when he began to reign, and he reigned for 40 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Zebiah of Beersheba, and Joash did was right in the eyes of the Lord all the days of Jehoiada. Oh, I always forget this. I'm so sorry. Jehoiada, the priest. Okay? And I just want to say this. Joash did what was right in the eyes of the Lord all the days of his life, or all the days, I should say, when Jehoiada was the priest. And he restored the house of the Lord to its proper condition and strengthened it. But you see that underline there? I wanted to highlight that. All the days of Jehoiada the priest. And I want to talk about him for just a little bit. Because Jehoiada rededicated the people of Israel back to the Lord. He tore down the false idols and got rid of the false priests. He introduced new administrative procedures in the temple in Jerusalem, so the Lord was honored, right? And the people of the land rejoiced and the city experienced peace. Joash couldn't have done what he did without Jehoiada. Jehoiada was a mentor that coached him, that loved him, that believed in him, that supported him, gave him godly counsel, godly wisdom, so you can see even throughout scripture, we need a generation that's going to empower and that generation also needs the wisdom of the one that's gone before. Does that make sense? Okay. So as I'm talking to us more so now generationally, both sides, if you would consider yourself one of the younger generations and you would consider, uh, consider yourself one of the older generations, invite them in and bring them along. So if you're a younger person in here, invite the ones who've gone before. Invite them in and bring them along. Or should I say, invite them in and jump into their boat, okay? If you think you're busy as a young person and think about your schedule, the person you're probably asking who has a little bit more experience in life is a little busier than you. It's all relative. It's all relative, right? But I remember when I had to jump in somebody's boat, like with Pastor Kiha who's here today, Pastor Creighton, who's here today, I didn't give them times of when I could meet. It's just, what are you doing and how can I jump in? You need your car washed? I'm there. You need to help set up chairs? I'm there. You need to do X, Y, and Z? How can I tag along? Right? And for those who are older, we need to invite the younger ones in and you need to bring them along. Right? Build a relationship first. Don't be weird about it. Right? It's not a chance where you get to make a younger person your slave, okay? Well, I have all these chores, hey, do this, right? It's none of that. But I remember going through this, um, Uncle Kiha is a prime example for me because he's a father figure for me in this. Someone who found every opportunity to invite me in and bring me along, right? My, my thing before anything else when I first started was I had to do Levites at 4 a.m. at Diamond Head Theater when we had that. Who was the man who was running all of that? Was Uncle Kiha, right? And I, sat, I set up chairs with him. We set up tents together. We set up the stages together. But it was in those exchanges, he was asking me about life. He was asking me questions. He was like, hey, what do you think about this? Like, this man has given me so much opportunity throughout my life. 
And it was literally this philosophy, just come along, just come, just come. Right? Like, even within leadership, this guy, he, I mean, he holds such a great office within our denomination at Foursquare, but he, would, he was like kind of like the health pastor for our islands at one point in our district, and he'd be in these like gnarly meetings, right, trying to just bring health to different church staffs. He'd be like, hey, you want to grow in conflict resolution? Come with me. And I'm like, are you sure? Yeah, just come. And I'm in these meetings. I'm hearing everything that's happening, right? But he's giving, like, he, I got to just observe how it's done, right? It wasn't just like, hey, Brett, here's some good books. That's good. We did it with one another, right? He brought me along, and I learned so much. But it took humility on his end to say, hey, I need this guy. He's a part of the future. But also humility for me, I need him. I need him. Not just for access, not just for opportunity, but I need to know how he's done it. And the beautiful thing about this man is that he will actually share so much out of his actual, his failures. If I speak to the older generations, you want a, a doorway and an entry point to the younger generations, just honestly start with your failures. Because it's this beautiful vulnerability of like, hey, I'm further along, but I'm right there. I get it. I get you. Right? And as a young person, when you see that, that takes so much. And they're teaching you probably the most important lesson, humility. Right? For us to even get to this space of having one table. It requires humility. It requires humility from these generations, and it requires humility from these generations. Where we wouldn't see this, and we wouldn't see this, but we would actually live this. We're all level at the foot of the cross. And I just want to say, what would happen if the generations actually got this right? What could a family look like if it wasn't just mom and dad and kids, but mom, dad, kids, and again, your context is different because we might have blended families, right? We might be single parents, but what would it look like? Again, not even just biologically, but spiritually, if you had the parents, the children, and grandparents too, right? Aunties and uncles. It takes a village to raise a child. And yet at the end of the day, no matter how old we age on this side of eternity, we're all children. I need a village. You need a village. Imagine what our state would begin to look like. If we, I mean, this is perfect. We're in Hawaii. We live Hanai. We adopt people into our homes. Right? You have kids. You might have kids. They have friends, and they become your sons and daughters too. What would that begin to look like? What would our world begin to look like if we just took the posture of humility and for generations to actually repent, humble out, and begin to honor and bless one another? I want to end with this quote by Jefferson Bethke. It says, we are all in the family. We are diverse. We are unique. And we, all, and we are all the very body of our King Jesus. The saying goes that blood is thicker than water. And that saying is true. But it isn't our blood that unites us, but his. And what's best is, as a true family should, we are all invited to the table. You know, when I was praying um, this morning for our time together and just like throughout the services, um, the Lord gave me a picture. And I know we've been kind of talking about like the table, so to speak. But it actually gave me the picture of a kitchen, right? How many of you love food here? Amen. God is good. Love food. If I, I, we were sharing this uh, question in a, one of our meetings that hopefully wasn't too boring for the team was, what would you do if you weren't working at C4? I know. Right? I just said, so everyone was like, what? And it's like, what would you be doing as a passion project? We reframed it. And I said, dude, I would love to be a food vlogger. I just love food. Love food. I can find, try to spiritualize food in any context. It's like God would make it a part of my calling. Anywho, that's not there. We're not at a counseling session. Okay. But he gave me the picture of a kitchen, and um, I was just reminded, and to each its own, right? 
but I was just reminded of um, my grandma, my obachan, who's no longer with us. She made the best, and when I say the best, I'm talking about the best, the best deep fried gyoza. Like she would, she would make it. I get so happy. I she walk like walk home with like four Dixie plates, you know, the regular plates or whatever paper plates. By the time my mom, dad, or sister got home, two was guaranteed gone. All I needed was just my TV show, gyoza, and ponzu, and just see ya. And the saddest thing, even in her later years, she was like, oh, I got to teach you. I got to teach you. And I actually never learned the recipe. I never took her up on the opportunity to learn from her in the kitchen. And to me, that's, oh, that sucks because I'm, I love gyoza, but no one makes it like my grandma. When I thought about my mom, my mom is another great cook. I think she's one of the best. Like, just can throw down anything. And um, there's all these recipes that she has. And I had this picture. This is the picture was, my mom could give me the recipe. But there's just something different when I'm in the kitchen with her. And I see how she does it. I see how she preps the food. I see the love and the tenderness and the care that goes into this dish. And I feel like for some of us here, actually all of us here, is that we can pass recipes. We can pass the recipe, but you learn so much more when you're in the kitchen together. And you get to see how it's done. For parents, it's going to take, and honestly, spiritual parents too. I'm just talking to the, the whole family right now. We can just pass the Bible. Right? Oh, here's scripture. Here's the word of God. But you got to teach them how to mark it up, how to fall in love with it, what to do with it, how to journal about it. Right? You can say, here's the book on prayer. But you got to teach them. You got to show them. You can say, hey, this is how we ask to lay hands. This is how we hear from God. Right? You can tell them, hear from God. But you got to show them what it's like. You got to be with them. Right? One of the greatest blessings I even have just set aside is when I think about Pastor Kiha and Auntie Heidi and just being spiritual parents to me and Jess and just sources of wisdom, is they invited us into their mess. They invite us, as, us into that space to just learn because I learned so much from just observing, right? I just saw the Lord say, don't just pass recipes, but actually teach them how to cook. And I'm talking about food, but the food represents the legacy of faith. Don't just pass the recipe, but show them how to cook. And if all you know how to cook is scrambled eggs, teach them how to cook scrambled eggs. If all you know what to do is make peanut butter toast, make peanut butter toast and figure something else out too. Okay? All I'm saying is just start where you are. Just start where we are. Just start where you are. Everyone belongs at the table. Amen? And so what I wanted to do to end our time before going back into worship, when we talk about humility and just the repentance, the restoration, the honor that needs to take place within generations, um, I've just had um, a couple of friends of mine, Brad and Kimiko, I just want to invite them up. I want them to actually um, lead us in a prophetic act. I just really sense that we want to break the negative stereotypes of the generations. We want to repent and ask for forgiveness, but we also want to honor and we want to bless because we need the zeal and the passion and the innovation and the childlikeness of the younger generations, but we also need the wisdom, the discernment, the legacy, the blessing of the older generations. And so... um, I just thank you guys for for being here. And so they're going to pray. They're going to actually pray on behalf of the generations they represent. Okay, and if I were to just kind of draw a little marker in the line right here. If you're Gen X and um, above, so Gen X, baby boomer, boomer, um, I'm going to ask that if this is resonating with you, to stand while Brad prays. And after that, you guys can go ahead and sit down. And then I'm going to ask pretty much the millennials and Gen Z because Gen Alpha is technically on the other side right now, that we would stand as Kimiko prays on behalf of us. Does that make sense? And so, Brad, I want to invite you up. And if you're Gen- Generation X or bo- uh, Baby Boomer or Boomer, I just want to ask you to stand. 
if you want to just agree with this prayer. Yeah, you're old. That's what you're releasing to the Lord right now. The humility to acknowledge it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Of our sometimes condescending attitudes, our know-it-all airs, and our judgment mindset. We have blown it in big ways and small ways. We're sorry to have put stumbling blocks in front of you when we should have been taking them away. We need to apologize to the young when we pretend to understand everything about you when we really don't. We need you at the table because without the young, the family of God is not complete. We need your fresh perspective and insights and energy. We now ask God for a blessing on all of those freshest from his hand. You're our children, our children's children, and the next generation. We honor you, and we ask God to give us his eyes so we can see you the way he does. We will strive to listen to you more, and we'll protect you more than we have if God has no grandchildren, then you are our younger brothers and sisters. Let's all sit at God's table together as people of equal status. We ask all this because we want this, but we also ask in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 And I'm um, just going to have Kimiko. So now if you're a millennial... Um, or Gen Z in this room, I'm going to ask you to stand. Before I pray, I just want to give out a formal apology. Um, on behalf of Gen Z and millennials, to all the generations that have come before us, I want to repent. I'm sorry that we focus so much on the differences between our worlds growing up, that we have failed to have compassion for you and your hardships. I'm sorry that we have not celebrated your victories, specifically the ones regarding your story with the Lord. A changing world does not equate to a changing God, and your relationship and experiences with him matter. I'm sorry that we have been quick to speak, slow to listen, impatient, and lacking in grace at times. And I'm sorry that we have let our own pride matter more than your wisdom, instruction, and guidance. So in all humility, I ask for your forgiveness and that you would receive this prayer of blessing. Dear Jesus, yeah, Lord, we just be honored right now in this space. Um, Father, I want to thank you for all the generations that have come before me. Father, I want to thank you that and from the standpoint of eternity, Lord, there's stories with you have just begun. So God, I want to thank you that with age not only comes an increase of wisdom, but an increase of intimacy with you, God. So Lord, I thank you for the intimacy that these people have with you, Lord. God, I just ask that your Holy Spirit will just give them more power, God, that they will feel your nearness, Lord, and that they will know you more and more every day, Jesus. Thank you, God, that you have given every single person a story with you. And thank you, God, that you will honor them and bless them. Father, I just want to break off any lies right now that say I am a failure. I want to break off any lies right now, God, that tells them that they are not enough. But thank you, Jesus, that you have seen their hearts, you have seen their prayers, and that you are answering those prayers, God, and you are honoring their hearts. 
So God, will you fill them? We ask for an increase of your presence in their life, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that your blood covers them and that they are safe and secure, God, in you. So Lord, will you bless them? And God, will you reconcile the generations of today? And in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. And so family, we know that this is not going to take um, place overnight, right? As anything, we're going to have to commit to this. Um, but I just want to encourage us in, in the midst of any disagreement, any frustration, any like, that doesn't seem right. At the end of the day, we're all at the table pursuing the Lord together. Amen. And so I just want to actually ask us to stand as a family together. We're going to sing this song, Build My Life. I want it to be a declaration over not just your biological family, but your spirit, our spiritual family as well. That we want to build this family on the rock. We're not going to go on the sand with what we think is right, but we want to build this family on the rock. Amen. Let's worship.